Welcome to Chapter 6, Making War in Republican Governments. Now let's get started. The Trials of War from 1776 to 1778. The War in the North. Few observers thought that the rebels stood a chance of defeating the British. Great Britain had more people and more money with which to fight. Few Indians supported the rebels. They were opposed to the expansion of white settlement. The British were seasoned troops and the Americans were militarily weak. Prime Minister North assembled a large invasion force and selected General William Howe to lead it. North ordered Howe to capture New York City and seize control of the Hudson River to isolate the radical patriots in New England from the other colonies. General William Howe and his 32,000 British troops landed outside New York City in July 1776, just as the Continental Congress was declaring independence in Philadelphia. Outgunned and outmaneuvered, the Continental Army retreated across the Hudson to New Jersey, then across to Delaware to Philadelphia. The British halted their campaign for the winter months, which allowed the Continental Army a few minor triumphs that could still not mask British military superiority. General Howe's military strategy was one of winning the surrender of opposing forces, rather than destroying them. This tactic failed to stop the rebellion in its early stage. General Washington's strategy was to draw the British away from the seacoast, extending their supply lines, and draining the, their morale in a war of attrition. The Continental Army drew most of its recruits from the lower ranks of society, the majority of whom fought for a bonus of cash and land rather than out of patriotism. The Continental Army was also poorly provisioned and armed. Given all these handicaps, Washington was fortunate to escape an overwhelming defeat in the first year of the war. Victories at Saratoga The primary British goal, the isolation of New England, was to be achieved with the help of General John Burgoyne, a small force of Iroquois and General Howe. Howe had a scheme of his own. He wanted to attack Philadelphia, home of the Continental Congress, and end the rebellion with one single victory. Although Howe took the city, the plan failed because Washington and his troops withdrew from Philadelphia, and the Continental Congress fled to the interior, determined to continue the fight. You need to remember what the Continental Army in Washington dodge and weave. Dodge, escape, then guerrilla warfare, attack, hide behind the trees and stone walls, and attack the British troops and wear them down by attrition. After the victory at Fort Ticonderoga, General Burgoyne, confident that his army would easily defeat the rebels, slowed his advance. American militiamen cut British supply lines and surrounded Burgoyne's forces near Saratoga, New York. After several skirmishes, Burgoyne surrendered to General Horatio Gates. The American victory at Saratoga was the turning point of the war and virtually ensured the diplomatic success of a military alliance with France. The Perils of War Wartime difficulties after the victory of Saratoga included a British naval blockade that cut supplies of European, <laughs> European manufacturers, the occupation of Boston and other major cities, and rising unemployment for urban and rural workers. Faced with the shortage of goods and rising prices, government officials began requisitioning goods directly from the people. Women's wartime efforts increased farm household productivity and also boost their self-esteem and prompted some women to expect greater rights in the new Republican society. Product scarcity contributed to inflation. It was a major problem and it's usually a major problem in every war. The fighting exposed tens of thousands of civilians to displacement and death. 
Soldiers from both armies looted, raped, and burned farms. Civilians on both sides punished those they deemed disloyal by imposing taxes, fines, and beatings. The Financial Crisis On the brink of bankruptcy, the new state governments printed paper money that was worth very little. Lacking the authority to impose taxes, the Continental Congress borrowed gold from France. When those funds were exhausted, Congress also printed currency and bills of credit which quickly declined in value. Inflation contributed to social unrest and rising fears that the rebellion would collapse. Valley Forge Farmers refused to sell their crops for worthless currency, even to the Continental Army. Either out of pacifism or the hopes of higher prices, farmers hoarded their grains or accepted gold or silver for their crops that only the British could pay. Military morale crumbled as the Continental Army suffered from lack of necessities. The winter of 1777 and 1778 at Valley Forge took as many lives as two years of fighting. To counter failing morale, Baron von Steuben instituted a system of drill and maneuver that shaped the smaller Continental Army into a much tougher and better disciplined force. The Path to Victory, 1778-1783 The French Alliance Although France and America were unlikely partners, the French were intent on avenging their loss of Canada to Britain in the French and Indian War. Upon learning of the American victory at Saratoga, French Foreign Minister Comte de Vergennes sought a formal alliance with the Continental Congress. The Treaty Alliance of 1778 specified that neither France nor America would sign a separate peace agreement before America's independence was ensured. In return, American diplomats pledged that their government would recognize any French conquests in the West Indies. Alliance with the French gave the American army access to supplies and money, strengthening the army and giving it new hope. Upon the urging of Washington, Congress reluctantly agreed to grant officers half pay after the war for a period of seven years. The war became increasingly unpopular in Britain. In 1778, Parliament repealed the Tea and Prohibitory Acts and renounced its power to tax the colonies. Due in part to America's alliance with France, the Continental Congress rejected Britain's offer to return to the constitutional condition that existed before the Sugar and Stamp Acts. A War in the South Britain's Southern Strategy American allies had ulterior motives for joining the war. France concentrated its force in the West Indies because it wanted to capture a rich sugar island. Spain loaned naval assistance because it wanted to regain Florida and Gibraltar. The British strategy was to capture the rich tobacco and rice growing colonies and to take advantage of racial divisions in the South. The revolution became a triangular war because the British as well as the American recruited slaves to their militaries. By the end of 1779, Sir Henry Clinton and his men had reconquered Georgia. And in 1780, Lord Charles Cornwallis and his men took control of South Carolina. The tide of the battle turned when another Republican-minded European aristocrat, the Marquis de Lafayette, convinced Louis XVI to send French troops to America. Guerrilla Warfare in the Carolinas General Nathaniel Greene devised a new military strategy. Divide the local militiamen into small groups with strong leaders so that they could harass and less the less mobile British. Weakened by the war of attrition, the British retreated hoping for a divisive victory in Virginia. Abandoned by the British Navy and surrounded by the French Navy and Washington's Continental Army, Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown in October 1781. Isolated diplomatically in Europe, stymied militarily in America, and lacking public support at home, Britain gave up prosecution of the war. 
the Patriot Advantage. Angry members of Parliament demanded an explanation of how a mighty country such as Britain could be defeated by a motley co colonial army. The ministry blamed the military leadership, pointing to, with some justification to a series of military blunders. The Patriots had French support and in George Washington, an inspired leader who kept morale from faltering and mobilized militiamen at crucial moments. The American people, who tolerated inflation and depreciating paper currency, were crucial to victory. A diplomatic triumph. In the Treaty of Paris, signed in September 1783, Great Britain recognized independence of its seaboard colonies and relinquished claims to lands south of the Great Lakes. To this land, between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River, was the dom domain of undefeated pro-British Indian peoples. Leaving the Native Americans to their fate, British negotiators did not insist on a separate Indian territory. The Continental Congress in several states forced Indians to cede much of their land. Other treaty provisions granted Americans North Atlantic fishing rights, forbade the British from carrying away any Negroes or other property, and guaranteed freedom of navigation on the Mississippi to American citizens forever. In return, the American government allowed British merchants to recover pre-war debts, and encouraged the state legislatures to return confiscated property to loyalists and grant them citizenship. The British made peace with France and Spain through the Treaty of Versailles. Only Americans profited greatly from the treaties. They gained independence from Britain and access to the interior of the North American continent for settlement. Creating Republican Institutions from 1776 to 1787. The state constitutions. How much democracy should they have? Pennsylvania's controversial constitution. In 1776, Congress urged Americans to suppress royal authority and establish new governing institutions by writing state constitutions to achieve republicanism. The Declaration of Independence stated that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Pennsylvania's Constitution abolished property owning as a test of citizenship, allowed all male taxpayers to vote and hold office, and created a unicameral, which is a one-house legislature, with complete power. John Adams denounced the Pennsylvania unicameral legislature as so democratical that it must produce confusion and every evil work. Tempering Democracy In his Thoughts on Government, written in 1776, Adams devised a system of government that dispersed authority by assigning lawmaking, administering, and judging to separate branches called branches he called for a bicameral two-house legislature in which the upper house, filled with property-owning men, would check the power of the popular majorities in the lower house, and proposed an elected governor with the power to veto laws and an appointed, not elected, judiciary to review them. Conservative patriots endorsed Adams' system. The bicameral legislature emerged as the dominant branch of government, and state constitutions apportioned seats on the basis of population. But most states retained property qualifications for voting and office holding. Only in Vermont and Pennsylvania were radical patriots able to take power and create truly democratic institutions. Yet in all the new states, representative legislatures had more power and the day-to-day -day politics became much more responsive to the demands of average citizens. You'll see here at the bottom left is a portrait of John Adams around this time. John Adams is the original author of the Massachusetts Constitution, which is the oldest written constitution in the world. It's actually the oldest still being used written constitution in the world. Women seek a public voice. 
Upper-class women entered into the debate but remained second-class citizens unable to participate directly in politics. Although not demanding equality to men, women sought legal equality such as owning property and signing contracts. Most politicians ignored women's requests, as did most men who insisted on traditional gender roles that empowered themselves. The Republican quest for educated citizenry provided the avenue for the most important advances made by American women. The war's losers, loyalists, Native Americans, and slaves. While some loyalist lands were either sold or given to patriot tenants, in general the revolutionary upheaval did not alter the structure of rural communities. Social turmoil was greatest in the cities as patriot merchants replaced loyalists at the top of the economic ladder. The war replaced a tradition-orientated economic elite, one that invested its profits from trade and real estate and became landlords, with a group of entrepreneurial-minded Republican merchants who promoted new trading ventures and domestic manufacturing. The revolution inspired yeomen and upstart entrepreneurs to demand property rights and access to land in the West from the new Republican state governments. Native Americans challenged movement into the Ohio River Valley, and Southern planters articulated revolutionary principles to defend their right to human property. White Americans denied Native Americans and slaves the rights and liberties for which they had fought in the revolution. Um, you look here, um, to the right, there's a painting of Abigail Adams. We put the little, um, line here. Don't forget about the ladies. She actually hoped that some of these customs with women, with men would be changed, owning property and things of that sort. And you can read this in the diary, not the diary, it's the letters written between John Adams and his wife, Eric, Abigail, their correspondence, she reminded him of this quite frequently. The Articles of Confederation. There's a continuing fiscal crisis. Congress improved in November 1777 the Articles of Confederation that provided for a loose confederation in which each state retained its independence. The Confederation government had the authority to declare war and peace, make treaties, and adjudicate disputes between states, print money, and requisition funds from the states. A major weakness under the Articles was that Congress lacked the authority to impose taxes. Disputes between the states over land claims in the West delayed ratification of the Articles until 1781. That took four years. Robert Morris persuaded Congress to charter the Bank of North America in the hope that its notes would stabilize the inflated Confeder excuse me, con continental currency. The Confederation refused Morris' propose proposal for an import duty to raise revenues for the national government. Instead, Congress asserted the Confederation's title to the Trans-Appalachian West in order to sell it and raise revenue for the government. The Northwest Ordinance. By 1784, Congress created a Southwest and Mississippi Territories, the future states of Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi, on land ceded by North Carolina and Georgia, and slavery was involved. Congress established three ordinances that provided for orderly settlement of the Old Northwest. The Ordinance of 1784 created the principle of territories becoming states, and the Land Ordinance of 1785 inaugurated the rectangular grid survey system and specified a minimum price of $1 an acre. You'll see that in the bottom right. The 1787 Northwest Ordinance outlined the step-by-step -step process territories had to follow to become states and outlawed slavery north of the Ohio River. These ordinances provided for orderly settlement in the West while reducing the prospect of dependent colonies of the states, but they also contributed to future, to future rift over slavery and conflict with Native Americans. 
Um, another thing to remember with the Articles of Confederation is that each state had one equal vote in national government. To amend, that means change the articles, you needed unanimous approval. You also needed a supermajority to pass legislation, nine of the 13 states. It was a very, very, very tall order. And what you would have is usually the smaller states holding out, like Rhode Island, Delaware, to be able to flex their muscles in this government. Shays' Rebellion. In the East, peace brought recession. The British Navigation Act barred Americans from trading with the British West Indies, and low-priced British goods flooded American markets. State governments were saddled with a large war debts in the form of bonds, which speculators demanded state governments redeem quickly and at full value, a policy that required high taxes, yet yeoman farmers and artisans hard hit by the post-war recession demanded and were given tax relief. To assist indebted yeomen, many states printed more paper currency and passed laws allowing debtors to pay their creditors in installments. The lack of such debtor relief legislation in Massachusetts provoked an armed uprising led by Captain Daniel Shays known as Shays Rebellion, a struggle against taxes imposed by an unresponsive government that resembled the American resistance to the British Stamp Act. To preserve its authority, Massachusetts passed the Riot Act outlawing illegal assemblies. Governor Governor James Bowdoin's military force dispersed Shays' dwindling army during the winter of 1786 and 1787. Many middling patriot families who had suffered during the war believed that they had traded one kind of tyranny for another. Others feared the fate of the Republican experiment and called for a stronger national government. The Constitution of 1787 the rise of a nationalist faction. Money questions dominated the post-war agenda, and officials looked at them from a national rather than a state perspective and became advocates of a stronger central government. Without tariff revenues, Congress could not pay the interest on foreign debt, but key commercial states in the North and most planners in the South opposed national tariffs, which again tariffs are taxes on imports. In order to prevent another internal conflict such as Shays' Rebellion, Nationalists in Congress called for a convention in Philadelphia and a revision of the Articles of Confederation, the Philadelphia Convention. In May 1787, delegates from every state except Rhode Island arrived in Philadelphia, there were 55 of them. Most were moneyed men who supported creditors' property rights and a central government. John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, Sam Adams, and Patrick Henry did not attend the convention. Nationalists were able to control the agenda. And Jefferson and Adams were in Paris, or Adams might have been in England. Sam Adams didn't want to go, neither did Patrick Henry. So, some different reasons. Delegates elected George Washington as presiding officer and to forestall popular opposition. Voted to deliberate in secret. The deliberations of of these men will not be released for years. So then they could be honest. In 